Hi, and welcome to a new series of videos and demos discussing high-performance cluster computing using Amazon Web Services. I'm Matt Wood, the Technology Evangelist for Amazon Web Services, and in this video, the first part of this series, we'll be discussing how to build a high-performance cluster using the tools from Amazon Web Services infrastructure platform. This is a hands-on tutorial. Uh, we'll be building a fully functional high-performance cluster of servers, and since this is the first video, uh, no previous experience of using Amazon services is required. We'll take things step by step, and you should feel free to follow along. I'll be focusing on high-performance computing here. From aeronautics to genomics to financial services, high-performance computing is becoming a common requirement in many fields of industry and academia. But the barrier to entry into this area has remained high, uh, with the expertise and costs needed to provide such facilities proving to be prohibitive. In 2006, uh, Amazon Web Services introduced the Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, in an attempt to lower the activation energy required to operate computational systems at scale and take care of a lot of the heavy lifting associated with managing and maintaining infrastructure. There are full details available at aws.amazon.com, but in summary, Amazon EC2 allows virtual servers to be created on Amazon's highly efficient operational infrastructure. These servers are available on demand. You don't need to purchase capacity ahead of time and there are no contract negotiations or upfront payments. You can provision the computational resources that you need as you need them. Like other Amazon Web Services, the Elastic Compute Cloud has pay-as-you-go pricing and you only pay for what you use. There are no startup costs, you only pay for resources when you use them, and just as importantly, when they are no longer needed, those resources can be shut down, and as soon as that happens, you stop paying for them. The pricing is per server per hour. Finally, uh, whilst we have friendly command line and web-based management tools, all these services are available as language agnostic web service application interfaces. This makes integration and automation extremely easy. Amazon EC2 makes a number of different server instance sizes available, depending on your needs. At uh, one end, we have micro instances, which are designed for lower traffic services, uh, development, testing, things like that. Uh, and from there, we offer a broad spectrum of server families with additional processing or memory capacity, uh, or both, all the way up to our most powerful cluster computing instances uh, with dual GPU cards. And it's these cluster compute instances uh, which we'll be using today to build an HPC cluster. These instances are very high specification and we'll talk more about the specifics in a moment. Uh, and we can scale to use the resources we need using the elastic nature of EC2. We're not limited to the static capacity of a traditional cluster. We can simply provision what we need when we need it without any upfront capital. Likewise, these Elastic clusters are highly available in that they are there when we need them uh, without having to wait for capacity on shared resources or requiring pre-approved or peer-reviewed permission. Just as importantly, clusters provisioned on EC2 are very, very easy to set up. They're easy to use and they're even easier to maintain, which means you can be up and running and get back to work very, very quickly. And it's really those features that I'd like to demonstrate in this tutorial. So here's what we're going to build. We're going to use Amazon EC2 to provision an 8-node, 64-core cluster uh, with monitoring of network, CPU, and memory usage. We're going to use EC2's fastest processors, fast interconnects with plenty of memory. And we're talking about dual quad-core Intel Nehalem processors uh, running at 2.9 gigahertz. They're each connected with 10 gig E networking, and they're physically closely located in the EC2 data center racks with each node having 23 gigabytes of RAM. And we're going to build this eight node cluster with no upfront costs, with no contract, and we're going to pay for it by the hour. Now we should be up and running in about 10 minutes, uh, depending on how fast you can type. Uh, and we're gonna bring up the cluster so that it's ready for use uh, in just four simple steps. You'll need an Amazon Web Services account to get started, if you don't already have one. Just head over to aws.amazon.com uh, the website looks like this, and you can click on the Sign Up Now link to get started. Uh, if you already have an account, just enter your details. Uh, and assuming you're new to using Amazon Web Services, you'll also need to sign up for the Elastic Compute Cloud. Uh, this is free. Just visit aws.amazon.com ec2. And again, you can click on the Sign Up link, and that's it. 
uh, you'll be ready to start using the Elastic Compute Cloud. So that's the administrative minutia over with. Uh, now we can get on to the good stuff, uh, actually building our cluster. So the first thing we're going to do here is to create a single node of our cluster. Uh, we'll instantiate a new Linux server on a cluster compute instance, uh, which goes by the slightly awkward name of cc1.4xlarge. Uh, that stands for cluster compute one uh, quadruple extra large, and those are the dual core Nahalem processors that I mentioned. After that, we'll provision 100 gigabytes of storage as an elastic block store and attach that storage volume to our new server instance. These elastic block store volumes offer persistent storage, which means that data written there will stay in place even if the server to which it's attached becomes unavailable. Uh, they also offer scalable storage, so we can create from a gigabyte up to a terabyte volumes. And their contents can be stored as a point-in-time snapshot, which is then backed up using Amazon's simple storage service. So here we have a single 8-core server with persistent storage. Um, step 3 is to set this server up as we want to use it, and then use it as a template for the other nodes in our cluster. Uh, these templates consist of two elements. An Amazon machine image, or AMI, uh, which is an image of our running server, and a snapshot of the data we want to use across our cluster uh, as an elastic block store snapshot. Both these template elements are stored securely and privately. In the final step, we'll use the template machine image to instantiate seven new cluster instances and collect them together in an EC2 placement group, which ensures that they are physically closely located to one another to minimize communication latency. And Without further ado, uh, we can actually go ahead now and build our 64-core cluster. So let's actually build this. So the first thing we need to do is log into our AWS account and the web-based management console. And you can see that we're greeted with the EC2 dashboard. We have a collection of tools over on the left-hand side and some information and shortcuts here in the main area of the console. To start up our first server, we can click on Launch Instance and we'll be guided through the process of setting up that server. The first thing we need to do is to select a high performance computing compatible Amazon machine image or AMI. We have a pretty large collection of machine images available to us in all flavors including SUSE Linux, Windows, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Amazon's very own Linux machine image. But for high performance we want a virtual machine which is configured to use hardware virtualization or HVM which will allow us to get closer to the physical hardware. We can find these by searching the Community AMI catalog for HVM AMI. You can see here that we have two images, both based on CentOS. We'll choose this version 5.4 for now and click Select. Next we can choose how many servers we want to launch, uh, which is just one in this case. And you can see that the cluster compute instance size is already selected, CC1.4x large. We can then define our placement group, which will ensure that all our servers are closely located for low latency communication. We can use any name here, uh, let's just go with cluster. Click continue. EC2 allows you to tag instances, uh, but we'll skip that in this case. And move on to creating our server login credentials, which take the form of a key pair. We'll create a new key pair, give it a friendly name, and download the public key so that we can log into our instances later. Next up is the network security groups. Uh, we'll create a new security group here and give it a name and a description. By default, all new servers have a default deny stateful firewall. Uh, if we want to log into our servers or run other services on them, uh, we'll obviously need to open up some ports for network access. There are some useful presets here. Uh, we'll add SSH and click Add Rule to open port 22 for access to our cluster servers. And that's it. We can now review our server settings and click Launch to spin it up. Done. From here, if we click on View Your Instances, we're taken to a list of all our running instances where we can see their status, their security groupings, and other metadata. Servers typically don't take long to launch, and when they're instantiated, their status changes to Running. We can now click on the instance and review the metadata, including the security group and the public domain name which we'll use to log into our new server. I'll just copy and paste that now for convenience. In addition to the metadata, we can also view the instance's metrics via the monitoring tab. Here you can see the CPU utilization, disk I.O. and network usage measurements. 
It's worth remembering that after the virtual machine is started, it may take a little longer for the operating system to boot before we can log in, so we'll revisit these in a moment. Now that we have our new server up and running, let's attach our Elastic Block Store volume. Clicking on Volumes takes us to the Block Store listings. You'll see one volume already listed, and this is the root partition of our new instance. We'll create a new one by clicking on Create Volume. We'll set up a 100 gigabyte volume. Uh, we'll wait a few seconds while it's provisioned. And then attach it to our new running server instance. Since this is a Linux server, we'll attach it as a new block store device. So let's log into our server. For this, we'll use the public key we downloaded a few moments ago. We'll need to change the permissions on that for the sake of privacy. And we can then SSH into the public DNS of the server. Just specify the key using the minus one option on SSH. We add the EC2 host name. And we're in. If I do a top and press one, we can see the SMP cores available on this instance. So let's go ahead and set up our first HPC node. We need to format our attached 100 gigabyte block store. I'm using extended second formatting here and specifying the block store device we used when attaching the volume. From there, we can create a mount point and then mount the block store. There we go. 100 gig of available storage. One pro tip, if you add this volume to the file system table located at etc fs tab as we're doing here, the volume will be automatically mounted when the server starts or restarts. We'll save that file and the storage is ready to use and you're now free to configure and customize your server to best fit your needs. Uh, in this demo, I'm going to upload a molecular dynamics tool and some sample data, which we'll use later. Uh, there's quite a bit of data to transfer here, so I'll just skip to the end. When working with an HPC server, it's a good idea to set up a new group and user to run the computational analysis. I'll add a new group here called data, and a new user called cluster. Since our cluster nodes are connected together with 10 gig E networking, we can actually run highly parallel compute tasks with low latency communication. These tasks are typically orchestrated via a job scheduler, sometimes over SSH, and so it's a good idea to set up your news user with SSH keys. Here we can create a new DSA key pair and add it as an authorized key. Uh, again, we need to set the appropriate permissions. Note that these keys will only be used for communication between nodes and not for administrative root access. And with that, we can log out. We'll discuss job schedulers such as SGE or Slurm in a future video. And so, without much fuss, we've launched a new server instance and configured it for high performance parallel computation. And we're now ready to create the template that will be used as a cookie cutter shape for the remainder of our cluster. So let's jump back into the instance listings in the console. We're going to select our configure instance, go to instance actions, and select create image. Uh, and again, we can give it a friendly name and description. And with that, EC2 will image the running server, including all of our configuration and data stored in the attached volume. It's worth remembering that the server will become unavailable during the imaging process. And depending on the size of the volumes involved, uh, the imaging process can take a few minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to skip ahead again. Now that our template image has been created, let's fire up the remainder of our cluster. We select the image, click launch, and now we can enter the number of instances that we'd like to create. Seven in this case. We can check the placement group. There's no need to download the key pair again. We can check the security group. And finally click launch and we're away. EC2 will now create seven perfect replicas of our configured servers, 
uh, with fast in interconnects and all the data we stored there when we were setting the original up. So there we go, seven pending servers and our original. While they are spinning up, it's worth mentioning security groups again. We can review the security group settings here and add network communication rules between groups as well as individual ports. Here I'm granting access for the nodes in this cluster to communicate with one another on all ports. If we click refresh, we can see the new settings. And with that, we can switch back to our instance list and see our full cluster is now available for work. You can log into each of these with your downloaded AWS key pair, but in this case, as a demo, I'm going to run a parallel computational task across all of the nodes. To do this, we'll need to tell the cluster which host names are available for computation. Uh, by selecting all the instances, I can cut and paste this list. Uh, but it's worth stressing that for truly elastic or high-scale computation, this is not best practice. We'll discuss much more efficient, automatic ways of working in the next video. The list goes into a file on one of our servers, and I'll use that server to launch the parallel analysis across our new fleet. We'll log into that node, change user, move to our data volume, and fire up an analysis run. This is just a demo run. Uh, this isn't EC2 specific. I'm doing a molecular dynamics simulation on a protein here. I specify the list of nodes here on the command line with some configuration options, along with the number of processors I want to use. I'm going to specify all 64 across our eight cluster nodes here. And boom, away we go. A full parallel analysis on 64 cores with fast interconnects and plenty of RAM provisioned, customized, and ready to roll in around 10 minutes. We can now check on our cluster's performance by heading back to the console and clicking on the monitoring tab. Here you can see the CPU utilization starting to ramp up across our instances, and here, the network activity between the nodes. Metrics are available at five minute intervals on all nodes for free, uh, but you can decrease that to one minute intervals by clicking here. So in summary, here are those steps again. Before you do anything, you'll need an AWS account and to sign up for EC2 at aws.amazon.com slash EC2. From there, you can use the web management console to spin up a new cluster compute instance before adding elastic block store volume storage and installing the various data and services required for your computation. You can then create your template instance, again, using the management console before scaling up to your full-size operational cluster and actually running your analysis. And with that, it only leaves me to say that when you've finished using your cluster, uh, don't forget to shut it down, and to thank you very much for listening. In part two, uh, we discuss the orchestration and automation of very large distributed computational farms, message queues, we'll talk more about data storage and using MapReduce on EC2. For more information, uh, check our website, and feel free to send any questions or comments to mawood at amazon.com. Thanks again for listening.